computer. Good. Bump, bump. Nerds, welcome to another tentacle filled episode of Straight Chilling, the weekly horror movie review show where you chill and we kill, slice, dice, and chop up yet another horror movie. My name's Bob. I'll be your host for the evening. This is episode number 308, recorded on Monday, March 1st, 2021. Tonight, we're going to be talking about Old Boy from 2003, which was the winner of the February poll pick. Before we get into it, let me introduce everyone else on the show. First up, Calling in from Washington, D.C., we got our boy Randy Gandy G. Landy. What's up, man? What's going on, my blue dragons? <laughs> I want to be red. Call me Red Dragon. I won't do it. I, okay. won't, I won't besmirch this film. That's very rude, but I guess I'll have to settle for blue. You will. Uh, last but not least, we got all dragon stains of self here. Soju, what's up, man? Anya <laughs> Naseo! me so Julio. what up boys it's a lot of vowels i understand yeah. you <laughs> vowel heavy. lots of vowels is that cajun or what yeah that is cajun, cajun. <laughs> got that this creole a, accent i hear this is a cajun film after mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. filmed in the bayou yeah you can tell Deep by all the, the high bayous of south korea <laughs> <laughs> down in the bayou eating a living squid you Gotta eat a squid. You. I don't know what the you fuck going on. Let's go on. <laughs> don't let me riff anymore, please. That's my favorite song. I love it. <laughs> um, so yeah, let's tackle some housekeeping real quick before we get into the main event. Uh, it's a new month, so that means we got a new poll pick. Um, the April poll pick is currently posted on our Patreon website. If you support us at the five dollar level or above, you get the chance to vote on a movie we're talking about this April. The theme for April is frights of spring in the three movies to vote between our invasion of the body snatchers from 78 troll 2 and the wicker mang from 73 all right bob how are those numbers looking so far well it's march 1st yeah <laughs> yeah still early, slim early in the game body snatchers is winning currently but is not it? not by too much so okay. you know it's, still could be anybody's game here Cool. First I thing this morning, there were already like three votes per, and I was like, well, Damn. this might be a tight race. Who knows? People follow close. Yeah. You know, straight chilling Patreon. The uh... time, for, time for somebody to start taking up the mantle and, and uh, making smear campaigns on the Slack and shit. <laughs> we, don't, we don't need to go there. Uh, the, uh, the winner of the March poll pick, by the way, was Wicked City. So we'll be talking about that here in the next couple of weeks. Um, slam your eyeballs into it. Get ready for some wild animated shit, apparently. All right. Adult uh, scene. Yeah, hopefully it's just filled with tentacles to the brim. Probably. <laughs> it's Japanese, right? Mm hmm Yeah, it is. <laughs> yep. So, so yes. Sure. <laughs> Simple math. Um, in other Patreon news, uh, we do have a brand new mini cast. <gasps> Oh. Um, and if you support us at the $10 level or above, you get access to Patreon exclusive content. Exclusive, uh, Bob. Exclusive content. You don't say the last <laughs> syllable around here, Bob. Uh, we don't appreciate people who do. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Uh, we, <laughs> Randy actually joined me on this mini cast. A uh, rare sight indeed. Yeah, first time, first time caller, Randy Gandy G. Landy. We talk about Psycho Gourmet. Um, so that's a bloody good time. If you want to hear our thoughts on that, jump over on our Patreon website, sign up. You'll get access to our Psycho Gourmet minicast, as well as over 30 other minicasts just sitting there waiting be for your ear holes. Be prepared. Be prepared. 
Prepare your body and mind to be bedazzled. <laughs> Especially your body. My body is particularly <laughs> prepared to be bedazzled. Uh, straight. The last bit of Patreon news and glorious news it is. We have a brand new Patreon supporter. <gasps> oh, yeah. We gotta that was what my gas was for earlier. <laughs> Preemptive. That's early. what your gas was for. <laughs> very gassy. Just letting little poots. Right now. Uh, we got to give shouts outs to Scott Zilla. Thank you so much for signing up and supporting us on Patreon. Every dollar you guys contribute goes right back into the show. It really does mean a lot to us. Um, and as is tradition around these here parts, we owe Scott Zilla the straight chilling salute. This one's for Scott. Slap me in the ass. Slap me. In the ass, mm-hmm. Scott. Inside, Zilla. please. Scott. Zilla. Get in there and slap it. Root around. Thanks, Scott. We appreciate Scott. it. For real yeah, thank you, Scott. Mm-hmm. Slaps aside. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In all seriousness. <laughs> Thanks. Um, your your shit's in the mail. It's heading your way. Um, it's getting one all... of those colon exams via the mail. <laughs> your shit is in the mail. Yeah. <laughs> you do it, do it yourself. DIY. Mm-hmm. Hope you got a mirror. Healthcare uh, is getting real weird in the states. Real weird. Yeah, well, gone too long. Just box up your duty and send it off for analysis. That's what we do around these parts. Mm, in Washington <laughs> D.C. Uh, that's all the Patreon news we have. Juice, you got some YouTubes, right? What's going on? Oh, my house is filthy. Let me clean it, please do. So, um, a little YouTubes. Um, tomorrow is Top 5 Tuesday. It is the first Tuesday of the month, so a new Top 5 list will be coming out. And um, since I had to do research for this film already, and I knew we were covering Old Boy, tomorrow's topic is going to be Top 5 Korean Revenge Films. Yeah. So I did one last year, which focused on Korean horror specifically, but this um, like revenge, like subgenre, it's very brutal. It's very like violent, um, but it's not always like quite horror. So I, I did a separate list because um, it's pretty popular over there. There's a lot of good films included in this <laughs> subgenre. What, Randy, you got a critique? Oh, I'm just, I mean, at this rate, we're <laughs> definitely going to be doing top five K pop bands within the next few years. Oh, months. yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. The true horror. <laughs> <laughs> It kind of is. <laughs> Come well, to yeah, find out. A little bit. I don't know, uh, man. I, I don't listen to the music, but the fans, they do God's work. So God bless them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so that's that's the list that's going to be coming out on YouTube tomorrow. Also, some new video game stuff is up there. Um, I mentioned last week that I'd started playing uh, Little Nightmares 2. I put up a, the first level on there if you're cur- curious about it or if you're just not interested in playing it yourself, but you'd kind of like to check it out. Um, the first level's up there. You can watch it. It's like 30 minutes. Um, I did a no commentary one, so it's just gameplay. If you want to throw it on in the background or you're curious about the game, that is up there now. And we have several games that are like that, uh, where it's just kind of horror gameplay if you're interested in checking that out without the commentary. Um other than that, I think I'm good. Tight. Uh, the last bit of housekeeping I have here real quick is uh, we got a new episode of Let's Get Physical Media. You can get that anywhere you get your podcasts. Uh, my boy Mikey and myself, we talk about all things physical media, specifically Blu-rays, 4Ks, DVDs. Um, we, do, we don't talk specifically about horror, but it is mostly horror. So we talk about Screen Factory, Arrow Video, some Criterion stuff was mentioned. Um, so if you're a collector or it's something you're looking to get into, check out Let's Get Physical Media uh, anywhere you get your podcasts. How's your laser disc collection looking these days, Bob? It's Slim? growing. It's massive. It's huge. Um, oh, my huge. God. I actually did have some laser discs that I got for free. I got a big crate for free. And I gave them all to uh, pour one out for Drew, our, our late cast member, Drew. He's still alive, he's, but he's just <laughs> no longer on the podcast. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> He was hit, he was hit by a, a, a speeding laser. truck full of COVID. <laughs> Drive by fruiting and he's just gone. Uh, no, yeah, I, I had like some Star Wars movies and shit on Laserdisc. I gave them all to him. I don't know if he still has them. I hope he does. They're they're pretty cool, but also just like I had no way to play them. So anyway, tangent. That's all we got. Our house is fucking clean. This house is clean.
Let's go ahead and get into the main event. We're going to be talking about Old Boy, and we're kicking it off with the back of the box. What's on the back of the box? <laughs> Bob, I know you have many of these boxes. We won't pull a <laughs> My Bloody Valentine and read it at the, uh, at the same Dude. time. So, huh? Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, uh, I do have two of these, DVD and Blu-ray. Anyway, the, uh, the back of the Blu-ray here says, a man is inexplicably kidnapped and imprisoned for 15 years and his wife is brutally murdered. On his release, he is given a wallet full of money and a mobile phone. A stranger calls and asks him to try and figure out why he was in prison. A girl appears and promises to help him solve the enigma and seek vengeance for his cruel fate. Um, old boy again we're talking about the original from 2003 the korean language film this was uh, directed by chan Wook park um stars a whole bunch of people whose names i refuse to butcher so i'm not gonna say them <laughs> um, general mangs have you seen this movie before and would you recommend people check it out randy uh yeah I, th- I would say that i mean i'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that between the three of us we were old fans of this film um having seen it I mean, for for me, at least first time in college. And uh, yeah, I think this is, um, you know, this is one of those movies that definitely toes a line where you you could definitely have the argument about which genre this belongs to. I think that probably its most evident connection is to uh, action film. So there's a lot of action in this. There's, you know, a lot of pathos in this too, and certainly some gruesome shit. So um, yeah, if that sounds like your cup of tea, you're, you're going to have a good time with this. Uh, I think that this is one of those movies that does exceptionally well at crossing over um, internationally from Korea. Uh, certainly it was one of the first South Korean films that I ever got a chance to watch. So recommend. We deal. Juice, what about you? Yeah, I, I think we all watched it together and I'm pretty sure that it was the first Korean film I ever saw. It left a huge impression on me. We watched it, I don't know, a long time ago, at least 10 years ago. So I was young. Bob was showing preteens these crazy Korean movies at the time uh, when he yes. was in college. But There's the joke, everyone. There it is. <laughs> You're waiting on it. We got it. But yeah, so <laughs> I had seen it before. Um and also, we've talked about this director a lot before. Um, uh, we covered Thirst just last year. Um, it's another movie he directed. So uh, I would recommend. I'm a big fan of this director and his work. And it's a, I mean, this is not a blank check recommend, though. Um, I, I think horror fans can handle it just fine. Um, but don't don't bring your mom along. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I would recommend Bob, yes, I know you saw it with me. So um, you have two copies now. Yes. Would you recommend people check this out? Yeah, I definitely would recommend you watch Old Boy if you have not already. I remember the first time watching this, it just like blew my mind in half. Um, I'd never seen anything quite like it. It's very, very um, twisted and and pretty dark. Uh, so if you're not into that sort of thing, then don't watch it. It's very, very much, uh, you know, about revenge, you know, Korean vengeance or whatever. Um, but solid, solid Sweet story. Korean vengeance. <laughs> it's the sweetest type Honestly, of American vengeance sounds like a Fox show. I could totally see that as being a thing. Would American not... vengeance. I don't think I'd watch that one. It sounds like um, cheaters, really. But... but yeah, definitely would recommend Old Boy. Check it out um solid recommend from the straight chilling crew let's go ahead and get into the rest of the movie we're dropping that spoiler warning here we go spoiler warning All right, real quick. I know Bob's got to do a plop synopsis. This I'm mm-hmm. hopefully helping. I could be complicating it a little bit, but we have three main characters in this. Um, so let's just go over their names and their pronunciations real Great. quick. Thank you. <laughs> so our main guy is Desu um, or Odesu. Um, Desu is fine. The girl's name is Mido. And I believe because it actually doesn't have the Korean um, letters here, but I'm pretty sure this is how this is pronounced. And then the last guy, the guy who's like the mastermind, 
Mm-hmm. Ooh, Jean. So like Eugene, but instead of you, it's ooh, Eugene. Eugene. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just kept calling him Evergreen because that was <laughs> yeah, yeah, all right, yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah. That's not bad. Eugene. So those are like really, I think the only three people we need to reference by name. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds okay. Right. What about Cisco, the right hand man of Eugene? Oh, Cisco, because uh, of his blonde hair. Just call him Cisco. Because he's got that silver <laughs> locks, his na- bro. Oh, his name is Mr. Han. Yeah, that's right, Mr. Han. Okay. From Lincoln Park. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> it starts with one thing. Sorry. Go ahead. I don't know why, Mr. Han. What if this movie was recut with Lincoln Park songs? I would watch it. <laughs> that sounds like some early Napster's bullshit. I'm all over it. Yeah, I'd be into it. <laughs> Um, I did not type up a plot synopsis for this movie because I, I just ran out of time. I can do, uh, I can run through it real quick though. Uh, the back of the box sort of got us into it. Basically, the movie opens up with our boy Ode Su um, being drunk and, and acting a fool. So he gets arrested. He's like held at the police station. His, his buddy comes to uh, pick him up and uh, it turns out it's his little girl's birthday and he's got her a present and uh, he, he calls her on the phone, the payphone. Um, and then his buddy sort of gets on the phone and turns around and Odysseus is just gone. So he gets kidnapped. Um, he gets imprisoned for 15 years. Um, they finally let him go. Uh, he has until the 4th of July to figure out who imprisoned them yep. and why the 5th of July. Um, and he meets a girl along the way. He works at a, a sushi shop um, and she uh, tries to help him figure out this mystery. They end up falling in love. Um, and uh, as the mystery unravels, we, we get a flashback and we see Ode Su uh, as a child, a teenager, I guess. He's in high school and uh, he's looking, he's creeping on these two people that are making out, um, getting naked, doing whatever. And uh, he mentions to his buddy that he, that he sees this girl uh, uh, getting jiggy with some dude and then he, he leaves. Um, and that... <laughs> That little little juicy bit uh, it sort of, I guess, spirals out of control. And it turns out that two people that were getting jiggy with it uh, is Eugene and his sister. So there's a little dash of incest going on here in the story. Still um, dash of incest. Just just a dash. To uh, taste. So uh, Eugene's sister, uh, because, because this gets out, people find out about it. She ends up committing suicide. Eugene uh, seeks vengeance on Odesu. So he imprisoned him for 15 years. And it turns out the girl uh, that is helping Odesu uh, crack this mystery wide open is indeed his daughter. And Bob. Yeah. Bob, no. Yeah. Bob, no. Yeah. So he got jiggy <laughs> with his daughter. And that's just another dash of incest there for you. Man, you're really committing to the jiggy line. <laughs> I don't know. We are, listening we to are a lot melding of, with boomers. This is our listening to a lot of Will Smith uh, getting jiggy with him. Oh, yeah. I mean, as you do. Um, so we, we find out, uh, yeah, he, uh, Odesu gets down with his daughter. Uh, he has like a mental breakdown. He cuts his own tongue out. He, he begs Eugene not to tell his daughter. Uh, Eugene actually ends up obliging and not telling her. Uh, and then the movie ends with Odesu uh, getting hypnotized so that he forgets that uh, he's fallen in love with his daughter and it works. And he and his daughter uh, remain in a happy relationship together. And, maybe. Uh, that's maybe. Yeah. M- maybe. We'll Reason see. to think that might not go off as planned. We'll talk about it. Um, but yeah, that's essentially the plot of this real fucked up movie. <laughs> yeah. And the one thing you glossed over primarily is just the instant insane amount of uh combat that goes on in this movie yeah to the action. point where that's what this movie is primarily known for is one scene in particular that's a long shot mm-hmm. in a hallway and Hell even yeah. if you haven't seen this movie you've probably if you're if you're into in the, the nerd circles like we are you've probably come across a shot or two from this movie from that scene of um odesu just wailing on ass with it just a ball with, with a <laughs> yeah. hammer. Dude, wailing on ass they're gonna beat the ass off of your body with that's right me hammer time um <laughs> stop hammer time. yes um yeah. so yeah. yes th- that's like that's kind of like the the that's the filling of this of this movie sandwich right here that's the meat people <laughs> really respond to that because it is really incredibly shot and really beautifully like like brutal <laughs> if that makes yeah. sense 
the fight choreography throughout this movie, specifically in that one scene, is, is incredible. Like Ode Sue fights, I don't know, 30, 40 people in a hallway. It's like an army of people. And um, so it's many. it's yeah. sort of realistic because he's getting his ass whooped pretty I good like too. how he also just gets his yeah. ass whooped. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it's not yeah. realistic in the fact that he would actually be able to get up from that ass yeah. whooping. Yeah. But it's mm -hmm. like such a fun fucking scene because he does whip some ass with that hammer um god that seems so badass and then he so good he gets stabbed literally and stabbed in the back in the middle of that fight and, and just the knife keeps rolling just stays in his back <laughs> yeah i love that shit oh my god yeah that's a cool it's scene. it's heightened for sure it, it ain't realistic yeah. but yeah. it's realistic enough to feel visceral yeah it does because they're also trying to like beat him with pieces of wood and like pipes <laughs> and shit they stab yeah. him uh, but he's just like breaking people's arms and legs and feet with a hammer and it gets nuts. This is after he did some impromptu oral surgery on a man with that same hammer. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, speaking of, brutal. I know, I know, uh, Hotline Kinks, Bob's definitely <laughs> an extra teeth kind of guy. So, oh, Bob, yeah. <laughs> Bob, were you popping the cuche during that scene? Yeah, I was at full mast. There's really nothing more. I, <laughs> That gets me going than, than just teeth, just shots up close shots of teeth. I love it. Oh, so yeah. be a dentist. The Should more enamel, the man. better. Mm. Now, that's that seems super gruesome. Like getting your teeth knocked out with the claw end of a hammer. I cannot imagine what that would and, be like. Yeah, I actually had beautiful. to. Sorry, go on. Yeah. I usually don't mind violence too much, but that one, it's such a sensitive area. And when they actually show him ripping a tooth, I had to like look away. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I was like, holy Dude. shit. Yeah, Ugh. that scene is really brutal. But then it's followed later. But where that guy comes back into the picture and has Odesu at his will and is about to pull the same stunt on him before yeah. he's stopped by our, our, our big bad who gives him a trunk full of money in exchange for sparing this guy's life instead of getting vengeance. Yeah. But it, before that happens, he's got the claw tooth on Odesu's tooth and then he like does a fake out and Odesu's like freaked out and he's like, oh shit. But then he goes back in to do it again and Odesu just starts wigging the fuck out yeah. and tackling <laughs> like an insane person. And that is like some, like it is really awesome. Like the, uh, I, I can't, I don't know the actor's name, but um, Desu's like actor is so, so fucking big when he goes off the rails yeah. and it's so fun to watch him go nuts. Yeah. Um, uh, another thing, I know we need to kind of back it up a little bit. We kind of yeah, got off on a tangent, <laughs> but with that same scene, one thing I like about this movie too, they, they do it like many times. It's pretty kind of like a, a theme that they play with during this um, movie, but specifically since we're talking about the tea scene, when he goes to take Odesu's teeth out and he fakes them out, yeah, he does this kind of like little bits of wisdom, which they do throughout the movie. Mm -hmm. um, but he's talking about like, um, they say, what, he says something like the people who feel the most pain are the most, are the people who have like the biggest imagination. So he's like, yeah. in order to be brave, you have to be like a very like stark person, like drop your imagination and you won't hurt so much. And it like, cause he would like fake them out. It's like, I didn't even do yeah. anything to you. And you like flinched, you freaked out because you imagined how terrible it would be to get your tooth like, and that's true out. man there's like studies and shit or like like even that um i don't know what it's called magic for humans i think it is on netflix they had this bit that's kind of a classic like like mind study thing where um you put your hands on the table one of them is hidden behind a wall or no yeah. you put your hand behind a wall and then like a fake hand right in front of you and then somebody comes in and suddenly smashes it with a hammer and you freak the out fake hand Cause, yeah <laughs> yeah because you feel your hand in a similar position and you're looking at a hand getting smashed with a hammer and your brain just combines those things mm -hmm. so yeah i mean there's there's some reality to that but the idea that odesu then just immediately adopts that into his mind he's like you know what you're right i'm yeah. not scared anymore because I don't give a fuck what happens now. I'm not imagining it. I'm really just imagining stabbing you with this fucking pencil I've got in my back pocket or whatever it is. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> so that's so, great. Yeah. Should we, should we, we should roll it back though. Yeah. Roll it back. Uh, I get like the first thing. So this, it plays out like a mystery, except it's not a mystery you could ever figure out. So you're kind of no. going along with this character and be like, what the fuck is happening? What the fuck is happening? Cause it's crazy shit. And the first wild thing is this guy gets abducted and he gets put in this room 
And he stuck there for 15 years. And I like that we're covering this now because for the past year, people have some sort of relation of what it's like to be stuck in a very small space. And so the idea that this man goes insane after being in this one room for 15 years, eating the same meal every day is maybe a little more relatable now uh, where people <laughs> just get stark crazy, like being stuck in their house with their loved ones or their family or friend, you know? So, um, I eat dumplings every day anyway. I'm dumplings fine. every I'm fine. day. Dumplings are my life. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I like, I like the process that they go through of showing him descend kind of into madness. So that this wacky ass character that you get to spend the rest of the movie with feels a little more grounded even though you know Mm -hmm. some crazy shit happens but even just the brutality of watching him punching a wall over and over and over because he's got nothing else to do and he's learning how to fight by watching boxing on television but Mm -hmm. literally that's all he can do for 15 years so he's just punching a wall and watching television watching boxing moves so when he gets out and beats ash you're like it does look like amateur but it looks believable you're like holy shit that he's just been punching a wall for 15 years like yeah he's just beating ass and you know he's hurt himself so much at that point that like he's he also has a pretty strong uh aversion to pain not aversion excuse me he's got he's able to withstand a lot of pain tolerance yeah. because yeah. yeah he's got a high tolerance for it because he's broken his hand punching a wall over and over again and doing all these certain things he, he really does linda hamilton the shit out of that that uh prison cell that he's in but it's an interesting thing because this is like he's not the only person there and that's one thing that i always wish this movie explored more was like i thought the first time i watched this i remember thinking like man i hope he lets all these fucking people out and they all just wail ass on this dude (laughs) am i saying that too much probably too much but um (laughs) anyway so like yeah there's like a, a handful of guards or whatever and then just rows and rows and rows of people being held for indeterminate amount of times i think a minimum three i think they specifically mentioned it's three floors worth they he's like i've got like three floors i think it's like floor seven to ten or something Mm -hmm. and i will say i will say this has happened to me a couple of times where i've strolled into a building in korea and been imprisoned and well, yes, <laughs> and and thought to myself like, oh my god, this really reminds me of old boy. Like this could be true. Like that you, you have these tall, tall ass apartment slash office buildings where like everybody just like minds their own business, and there's just like so many buildings in Korea that are like this, especially like you if you're in Seoul. And like, I went to get one, like my iPhone fixed one time. And it's just this random room where you like have to knock on the door to go in. Nobody keeps their like doors open. And it's just rows and rows of halls and you see no other person. And there's floors and floors of it, just like that. Like, like and buildings in Seoul will go up like 30, 40 floors. And there's like hundreds of them. Yeah. So it's not too unbelievable to think that three floors somewhere has a shit ton of people cells, in yeah. prison. Nobody would fucking know. No, like, well, why I, would you I, stop on the seventh floor of this building? Why would you do it? There's no reason to. So it's. I would actually go even further and say that that's almost certainly happening somewhere because human trafficking is a huge fucking thing that does definitely does exist. And whether or not yeah. it, it exists for the reasons of an Machiavellian plot for revenge, probably not exactly like this movie. But there's definitely people fucking being trafficked and or otherwise imprisoned yeah. for years at a time off the grid somewhere in yeah. office buildings probably and like certainly out in the sticks there are certainly things like that going on and it's horrific to think about especially in the context of uh of reality as opposed to this movie where it's you know a little bit heightened because of the situation going on around it when it's even an interesting kind of believable idea that like if you were able to like have rent this space or whatever now some of it's not like the the hypnosis and the gap pumping and gas like right you know, that's less believable that's comic booky sure but the idea yeah. that you would start a business where you would go pay someone and they would kidnap someone and hold them for a certain amount of however long you pay them for Mm -hmm. is not so unbelievable. It's not impossible. No, yeah, it's not. Like once you think about it, 
<laughs> yeah, once you think about it, you're like, oh shit, yeah, that that really could because even we get like these like kind of flashbacks or he's listening back to a tape because he's trying to figure out like who imprisoned me and he finally tracks mm-hmm. it down to the actual building. And so that's when he tortures the guy by pulling his teeth out. The guy said, you know, I don't actually know who it was, but we taped. It's like an audio recording. And so he's listening back to it and he's like, how long do you want to hold him for? And the dude's like 15 years. And obviously that's not the norm. And so it's longer than usual. And that's where it gets into like, you know, is he going to go fucking insane? How can we keep him as sane Mm -hmm. as possible? But also it goes like tells you that this dude is loaded, like money wise, like this dude's super well to like keep somebody in prison and to feed them and to pump gas in their room to make them sleep and shit. Like for 15 years, you'd have to be like, have a lot of money. Oh yeah. And we come up, definitely come to find out that that's the case. Can we talk about Eugene for a minute? Because it's not just his, his wealth, but like he, this, the level of scheming that he's doing in this movie is probably the most unrealistic thing out the movie. I would (laughs) agree with that. Yeah. That's my biggest problem with it. Continue. Yeah. All I was going to say is really just that like the amount of moving parts that you have to be absolutely certain about going Mm -hmm. perfectly right is so huge like to me i'm watching the end of this movie just to skip ahead for a minute where they're having their final confrontation and he's like ah but if you kill me then you don't blah 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 i I, my immediate thought was walter white uh just doing just taking the shot and being like fuck you i don't need to know i need to get (laughs) like but to be fair now if we're going off the ending of this now the plausibility of everything that happens to figure out this riddle is much more of a stretch to me but in the end the guy kills himself anyways so he's prepared Mm. to die like he's the only thing he's living for is to torture this man so if Mm -hmm. it just so happens that this man turns around and kills him i don't think that's a big deal it ends he keeps that like badass bodyguard around until the very end. So he tries to keep it going as long as possible until he literally doesn't give a fuck anymore. So yeah, I mean, you're definitely right. Some steps in place to me though. Like, yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking, you know, as you do, I'm inserting myself into the the role at that moment. And I'm thinking, no, like I don't need to know anything beyond what I already know to know this guy deserves the the ax. I'm going to take this guy out. And I'm not going to let him say another goddamn word because who the fuck knows what kind of bullshit he's going to pull out of his ass. Like, that's just the way I think about it. Like, if you're on a revenge quest at that point, Mm -hmm. you know what he's done. You know, like, he's imprisoned you for 15 years. He's threatened and almost killed, like, people that are, like, he has killed people that you love, your wife. He killed your wife and framed you for it. This is a guy that deserves some some retribution um, on some level. So Odesu is planning on taking that. And I wouldn't let... My personally, I wouldn't let my questions for questions inhibit that in any way. I wouldn't need answers at that point. But that said, like his whole thing, Eugene's whole thing is that he watches him for those fifteen years. He's obsessed with this man, so he gets into his head. Is the is the presumption that's what's going on, and so that is supposedly what enables him to predict how he's going to act in conjunction with the hypnosis. The hypnosis so, I mean, is super wonky to me. Like yeah. that, that feels really out of place for this movie. And the fact that it sort of takes it, it affects the movie in two different ways. It affects it in the way that like allows you Eugene to manipulate Odesu and Mido and mm-hmm. somehow like predict that they will meet up. And like, because of certain words that are spoken to Odesu over the phone, like he acts a certain way and says something and those words will cause Mido to do a thing. All that just feels like sort of out of place in this movie to me. And then again, at the end where Odesu j- seeks out to be, to be hypnotized again so that he can sort of like, you know, erase his memory yeah. of all this terrible shit happening. It feels and weird. You know, it does feel weird, but, and, and I think the reason is because they definitely started at the, this is a, a movie where you can see them writing it backwards. You know what I mean? Like they yeah. needed that last confrontation. They needed him to have been fooled all the way up to this point into doing what he's done with what turns out to be his daughter with everything else, you know, like all this stuff needed to go perfectly so that you could have this big reveal. And there's only one way to do that or not only one way, but there's only magical ways to do that. You know what I mean? There's no realistic Mm -hmm. way to perfectly fine tunely predict this unless you did some shit. That's also like sci-fi or something, you know, it has to be magical realism that gets you there. So that's their way of doing it. And to that extent, I'm like, okay, if it was a lesser movie, it was a less entertaining movie and a less movie that kept, didn't like string me on so strongly and keep me engaged so much. 
that would be a problem for me storytelling wise but this movie is so good about keeping every beat really stylistic and really like keeping you on your edge of your seat in terms of just the cinematography and just the way they're presenting things as they're happening like some of the shots in this movie are fucking awesome um like there's this one shot in particular that stood out to me this time and it's a really small thing but when they're going to all of the restaurants the blue dragon restaurants to find Mm -hmm. the dumplings that he's been fed for 15 years so that they can backtrack to where this place was and find the boss he they have this shot of odesu like eating all these things and being like disgusted with them and then he's standing there there's one shot of him like looking really grim and pallid and like like over it and it zooms out and it zooms out through his chopsticks by the dumpling. I don't know why, but that shot in particular will like really stood out to me this time. It's a small thing, but that's like, again, like thinking about Breaking Bad, like that's that like really heightened level of, of, uh, of camera work that adds like some drama to a scene, but it only works if your drama is legitimate. And it feels like you've, you've, as you're going through these missions, you've really attached yourself to why, why is this happening to this guy? And you're really invested, or at least I was, with what's going on to him, what's what's happened to him, and his quest for vengeance. So you go along with it, and it seems like a perfect like punch up to that scene. Yeah, I was gonna touch on the hypnosis thing, and I agree that it is there. There are things that we mentioned like feel kind of comic booky, like the the gas and the stuff like that. Amongst things are really grounded, and I wanted to may, possibly explain some of these things away because. Old Boy is the second film in um, this director's like vengeance trilogy, where the Mm -hmm. first one being um, uh, Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance, which I actually just watched for the first time this week because we were covering this film. And I wanted like to kind of reference things. And this director is capable of creating situations that make more sense. So in that movie, it kind of reminded me of like sympathy for Mr. Vengeance of kind of like a lock stock and two smoking barrels type of movie where you got all these kind of moving parts that ultimately all kind of come together in a very like, Oh shit kind of way. And maybe one of the reasons why this one feels a little more detached and comic booky is because it is old. The story of old boy is based off of a Japanese manga. Manga. That was, wow. that was for Randy. Manga. <laughs> uh, yeah, so culture. I, a Japanese manga. Um, that and even Hydroberg has it. I think Hydroberg was setting us yeah, up on the I, the Slack. Um, mm-hmm. and so that could be one of those things where it's trying to you know stay true to that story because I know that he's capable of creating these moving parts that make more sense than just somebody was hypnotized i guess yeah and you're right like it's comic book because it's from a comic book like to some extent i don't know what elements are taken and which aren't so maybe that's new to the movie but there's a reason for that to be the case so that's fair there's a plot even if it wasn't it's like style it's just like to me it's like it's clearly an actiony you know heightened reality style that has enough grounding to keep the keep you wincing when the teeth start getting pried out yeah true (laughs) There, there is a plot beat in this movie that sort of bothered me a little bit, or it left me questioning. I don't know, maybe you guys have an a explanation for it. But I always wondered, like, Odesu gets out of jail, or, you know, essentially gets out of jail. Um, after 15 years, and he meets this girl named Mido, like, would he not, like, did she change her name? Or would he not I wondered that too. the dots that, like, I have a daughter with the same name who would be exactly your age right now? Well, that was the thing, is because I, so... That was something I was focusing on this time because I couldn't remember the details of that. And I think what happened is, and I think a little bit of this comes up in true too, which I can go ahead and mention it because there's like a shit ton of trivia. Do it. So he gets out and he meets this girl and then she knows the story. She reads his diary and knows that this was a man that was in prison 15 years ago. His wife died. His daughter's missing because she tries to help him find his daughter. So they track it down to this place where she was adopted, but now she's living in Sweden. She has like a Swedish like phone number and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. In the trivia, it says that I think the phone number, it's like goes to the Korean embassy in like Sweden or something like it's bullshit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that was part of the implication of her hypnosis. And I think 
part of the, the situation, one actual problem I have with this movie is they totally gloss over the idea that his wife was murdered. Like yeah. that's not yeah. even a scene that led that's shown or anything. He doesn't even reminisce on that shit. But I think, don't they mention that she, when she's supposed to be like a young woman, she's still like very young. So I think mm-hmm. the implication is even when the mom died, she was still a young age. Yeah. And yeah. that she, like, part of the hypnosis was to, like, create almost this new world and identity. And it was easier because this guy had the funds to, like, support her for her life and just kind of, like, made this new life for her. So, like, her yeah. name was changed. And, like, he her said life he was, was changed and she was her. hypnotized. <laughs> yeah. Like, mm-hmm. he said he was, like, behind the scenes raising her, which I took to mean exactly that. And the thing is, like, I, it's again that thing where you know any of our problems that we have with this you could you could easily just be like hypnosis and then leave yeah. it at that yeah and yeah. that can be satisfying for some people and non satisfying for others for me it's like I, I, this is not usually the case for me I'm usually pretty like you know I can be pretty hard on movies for things like this but it doesn't bother me so much because this movie is so stylish and like I, I kind of covered this a second ago but it's so stylish that I don't have really time. <laughs> I don't have like, I don't have brain space to dedicate to poking those holes like I do with other movies because I'm just like jazzing on all fucking cylinders the whole movie. And just jazz- jazz- Randy. Well, and it <laughs> also too, and it, it does this on purpose again with like those little bits of like wisdom because another thing that happens, he's released, he doesn't escape. He's released in this yeah. box. And the first person that he meets is this guy that's about to kill himself. Right. And I want like, to talk before about he kills himself, I want to tell you my story. And so he tells him his story and the man kind of like imparts this line and it's like, I know that I'm no better than a beast, but like, don't I deserve to live or, to live, or something yeah. like that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so um, that kind of drives some of the movie, but this this film, it is st- the focus, you know, from like the very beginning is style and more of, fi- of a philosophical one. And because this is like part of the Vengeance trilogy, it really is like posing this question of what is vengeance worth? Like, do you get anything from it? Um, and the answer in all of these movies always is no, like it ruins everybody who's involved nobody is a winner nobody comes out on top you're like you only make the situations worse and so i think because this movie is stylized and like anchored to philosophical ideas specifically about vengeance but throughout this like one specifically they're dropping all these little like little tidbits on you that i think it's easier to gloss over some of that shit because you're like that's not really the point the point isn't to have this airtight story where every single thing makes perfect sense. It's about the feels behind it. See, you know, to some extent, I I mean, yeah, I see what you're saying. I I don't know that I totally agree though, because I would say that like the style of this movie is great and it keeps me like, it just keeps me like, I, I salivate with some of these shots. These things are great, but the thing about it is like the story, the philosophy behind it. And maybe this is because I'm just missing it. I've seen this movie a bunch of times. And other than what you just said, which is a very kind of broad topic, I don't necessarily know how some of these things tie in, except that they're just things to further warp Odesu's point of view and that we get to hang on to. Like when he that guy says that line to him at the beginning of the movie, the guy who's going to commit suicide, uh, Odesu sits him down. He's like, first, I have to talk. I, you're the first person I've seen. I have to tell you my story. He tells him his story. And then the guy um, says says that line to him and Odesu gets up to walk away and the guy's like, but let me tell you my story. And he's like, hey, wait, you're not going to hear my story. It's like, I don't know, which is just kind of funny and kind of like, like idiot. I don't know, it's kind of like a, a, just a charismatic little thing for him to do. But yeah, like things like that and the idea of, you know, what's vengeance worth and all that stuff, that, that's all fine and good, but I don't know that those points are driven home <laughs> so I, as much as they are yeah. like piecemeal, like uh, a la carte philosophical options for you to cling to. I'm not sure how well they hang together is I guess what I'm saying. 
There's also the parallel, like a very clear parallel in the, the beginning of the movie where he saves that dude's uh, life on the top of the building. Mm-hmm. And then the end of the movie, we get, when we get the flashback where um, old Evergreen's sister kills herself. He's like holding her hand as she's falling off the dam in the exact same way that Ode, Ode sure. is holding this dude's tie as he's hanging off the building. And like in one situation, uh, the person is saved and the other one uh, they're let go and, and she ends up falling to her death. I don't know like why those shots are parallel or like how they connect point. really at all other than it's just like, oh yeah, I remember that. Somebody trying right to commit movie. suicide, somebody stopping them, but for but wildly different reasons. Yeah. In her well, case, I, it was because her husband, her brother loved her. Um, I think, well, yeah. Case, it's because it's, he needed to talk to a person. Well, I guess it's different because in the, when, in Eugene's case, it's somebody he loves and cares about. But I think mm-hmm. the point of those things is creating, even from the beginning, these parallels between Eugene and Odesu, which is something that Eugene is purposefully trying to do as part of his vengeance. He doesn't want to just leave this guy in a um, in a room for 15 years. Like that's not mm-hmm. even the point. The point is the idea of like creating someone that you love and then like watching them destroy themselves or creating a situation that would destroy themselves through like the incest situation and everything like yeah. that and so i just saw that as another parallel cinematically to link these two characters together which i think then further drives okay. on the idea of the point. vengeance because it's just this cyclical thing where it's yeah. like i i get back at you you get back at me i get back at you and it just creates this parallel like from a visual standpoint of like what these two characters are going through it's the same same situation for both of them for yeah for eugene success looks like him killing himself like the, him killing himself with the satisfaction of knowing that he has taken everything you can take from this guy and more than that he's left him in a situation where he has to either you know continue living you know and 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 learn how to accept this thing that he's just learned this horrific thing it's a really disturbing thing or kill himself and it's like i guess that kind of leaves and he doesn't have the benefit of somebody to cast vengeance upon anymore the way that Eugene did. So he's leaving him worse off for it. All he can do is like impotently rage about it, kill himself or move on. Those are his only options. He doesn't, he, there's nobody to, he can, he can go after anymore. So yeah, I guess to that extent, I could see that. And it, you know, I don't know. I, I had some other thought, but it escaped me, but that, that's a good point. I think. Eugene is like, obviously the villain in, in this movie, but also like he, he's seeking vengeance on Odesu because like his sister commits suicide because Odesu like, you know, ran his mouth a little bit, but also Eugene could have just saved his sister. Like he let her fall. Like he could have just well, saved That's the her. thing is also displacement of your own sins also is going yeah. on. Yeah, And that's true of Odesu as well, because he is not at his daughter's birthday party. He is so drunk that he's oh, no, arrested yeah. you know what i mean and then he disappears like sh- and, and like odesu his character at the beginning of this film or like before his 15 years of imprisonment is like just like a, a drunken buffoon like he's a yeah, he's a he's, doofus even when he's a kid he's he smokes and he's like mouths off but he also falls off the fucking jungle gym like he's an idiot and the idiot t- like turns into like this mass murderous capable monster man by virtue of being like in in this situation through the virtue of vengeance from this mm-hmm. other guy for his idiocy but also his sin was so small all he didn't he didn't actually go around and tell people yeah that girl's a slut or yeah she yeah. slept with her her brother anything like that all he did was say to one guy on his last day in town like yeah i saw her like making out with some guy it looked like they were going to go all the way or some shit like that and that's it. But that's all it took to, and in, in that that is the the original sin in in Eugene's mind that just infiltrates and con- corrupts his entire life. His entire life is dedicated to killing this man now, because he doesn't have the love of his life or whatever. I don't know. Like, I I just feel like there's a lot going on for the vengeance angle, and it's really cool to see how those things parallel or whatever. But yeah, the 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 intricacies of how this stuff works is where the shortcomings really come. And if you really want to like sink your teeth into the, the reality of what could be happening. 
I so I thought they did a pretty good job of addressing what you guys were just talking about. And it's something that I didn't remember until I saw it again this time. Like it wasn't a detail that like I remember sticking out in my mind. But they they do address that a little bit in that, like, yeah, Desu is blamed, but ultimately he calls him out because he's like, Who took this picture on the dam? Like your sister killed yeah. herself on the dam. And then he was who not took expecting this fucking that. picture. Yeah. And you see kind of the like his mental walls that he has built up to blame Desu for this, like start to crumble a little bit. I thought that was a pretty cool moment because ultimately what it comes down to is he impregnated his own sister and the shame of that, he tried to play it off as like, no, your lie your, made your her body like warp because everyone said she was rumored she was pregnant. So her belly started getting bigger. And he was like, no, I think you really impregnated your own fucking sister. And neither of you could really live with that shame. And she actually had the balls in a way to like kill herself because she couldn't deal with the shame. And you're the one who's blaming other people for it. it. Way, yeah. Well, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like she actually, yeah, not the balls, but I'm just like, he, well, she didn't skirt her her role in the matter. Yeah, she accepted and said, like, I can't deal with this. And he, instead of saying, like, I kill my sister or our acts led to this action, he warps it in his mind to a lie and blames it on Daisu. So yeah. um, I, I thought they addressed that actually pretty well um, with that moment. And something I forgot, and I was like, oh, I like seeing his, like, walls crumble when he's confronted that's with true that. yeah and, and like when you take like that that moment is really powerful and so yeah if, i guess if you take away the act of of her falling off that day but she could have killed herself a number of ways too so yeah. they're making it resonant on purpose on per on purpose on purpose <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, so yeah i don't know like i i think that i i don't know the, the movie it feels like there's parts of this movie that are just less baked than others. I think that overall it makes a damn good dessert, but you know, sometimes sometimes your cake is better for the icing than the cake and vice versa. So, you know, I kind of feel like maybe there's just like a few elements that are a little bit lo more loosely strung together than others, which is kind of easy to see why, because they're making this, they're adapting this property that's talking about this insane Machiavellian plot that you have to bring down to earth enough to where people are invested. In a and also able to sit through violence and gore in order to receive the the story in the messaging. One thing that I wanted to bring up, though, this is completely aside, complete non sequitur. The music. Did you guys like the music in this movie? I was loving it this time, and I never I really did, paid yeah. attention to it. Yeah, all three of his movies, like the Vintage Trailer, have like really cool soundtracks behind them. I feel like. Uh, like and maybe it's a cultural difference or maybe it's just you know maybe it's just the style of the time but i remember the style of action movies of that time especially to be very bombastic very like like um i don't know think about the movie fucking crank you know what i mean think about like the fast and the furious movies or whatever these are movies where they have like high action moments like this movie but their high action moments are offset with like that sort of shit and this movie goes the opposite direction it sounds like it could be like the soundtrack to the crown or something there's just really wistful like soft music especially towards the end when all this coming out it's like very like like not classical music so much as just like instrumental orchestral music which is just so interesting for an action movie from this time period to me it's also know, what do you guys think about that yeah i i like i really did like the soundtrack but it also like in you bringing up the soundtrack it also brings up some other points of why i kind of like low-key love this movie a lot too is because this movie came out in 2003 and it's like funny for you to compare it to movies of that time and one of the things i like love about this after the fact now that I know a little bit more about it from a cultural standpoint in Korea is that this when I saw this movie the first time it was so fucked up it's still really fucked up it's it's like an action movie but it's like imagine if the Fast and the Furious like the brother and sister were banging it out like what yeah. you know like oh I do it, often it's so <laughs> it's like action based and yet it's also very stylized and cinematic and like a very like the craft is amazing and making of this film. And also like the story is just so bonkers. And yet 
It's so dark and fucked up. But because of its success and because of its craft and just its its success as a Korean film, especially internationally, there is hardly a Korean that hasn't seen this film. Like, it's not this underground, like, cult status thing in Korea. Like, this is a movie that's so fucked up about incest and people fucking banging their daughters and cutting their tongues off and shit. And it's touted, like, in Korea, it's like, yeah, you need to watch Old Boys. Like, because it's so successful. Because it's so, like, well-crafted and things like that. And I, like, that's such a fun anomaly in my brain because trying to think of like if a movie like that came out in the states like what a grandma would say about you need to watch old boy like no i you, can't you put know. those i can't put those pieces together but that's kind of how it is in korea and it's funny to me to hear people say like oh shit oh boy yeah that's like a great korean film and it's like fuck <laughs> like it's, it's so the, fucked up old boy is to korea, south korea what peanut butter solution is to Canada. So. <laughs> I guess it, so, yeah. It's like <laughs> the, um, I don't know, the equivalent in America is like, I don't know, maybe Deliverance. I'm trying to think of like a classic movie. That's yeah, maybe twisted. like Shawshank Redemption because it's got a lot of yeah. rape in it. Yeah, there is a lot of rape in that movie. Um, I mean, less about vengeance, that movie, but yeah. I mean, something kind of similar that's yeah, like yeah. really dark and fucked up, but it's like done. Also, this was kind of like this director's kind of big breakout it's the second movie in the vengeance one and he did have that korean movie that was more pop or uh popular like in 2000 but it was like a military film it wasn't very like stylized you know it was kind of like a by numbers thing at the time and so this is kind of like his breakout too and now he is like kind of touted mm -hmm internationally it's like oh this is representing korea like oh look look what like, good directors we have like look how stylized they are and specific to korea they are and so people like rally around that like yeah you need to watch old boy like this is where this guy like got his come up and it's like that's kind of cool it's kind of interesting too because like you think about i i was thinking just now about a serbian film and <laughs> that movie also has incredibly fucked up things and it also has some action sequences but that movie is maligned and reasonably so, I yeah, would say. True. Um, but like it's no no grandma anywhere is suggesting that <laughs> shit. Nobody in Serbia or anywhere Serbian else. Serbian grandmas well, have love you, it. Kids, you want to sit down and watch Serbian film with Grammy? No, nobody's that's doing a, that shit. That's <laughs> a really good point, though, because that is, is such a fine line. <laughs> Because I remember watching this movie and thinking how fucked up it was. And it had just like crawled into my brain and has never left. And just like something you like is indistinguishable. It's like so specifically unique. And you're like, oh my God, yeah, oh boy. And yet I, I always and like I highly regarded it. And But you're right. A Serbian film is like very similar in a lot of ways and it yet is, it's like disgusting it's and, way more yeah, graphic it's well it, it's yeah, way more it graphic is. but also and i think this is kind of the key change at least in my mind just riffing right now that's this is what i see as the key difference is the tone we were talking about the comic booky aspects of this movie we're talking about the, the the magical realism that exists within a somewhat realistic world i think that that gives the human brain enough room for disassociation from the more fucked up aspects of this movie and also the lack of the extreme extreme graphic shit that goes on in a serbian film so like those two key differences will, will make the thing like the the graphics graphicness of of a serbian film is obviously what keeps it out of like most people's hands just on on face value alone as it should but then you also have this aspect of fucking magical realism where like you don't when you watch that movie you're not like i don't know there's nothing about it that to me is like is like there's magic in the world that explains how this plot is driven the way it happens here and to me i just think it gives us a, a social a way of disconnecting when it feels too close or when it feels too too personally disgusting do you know what i mean i don't know maybe I, that's just me riffing on an idea but i to me it seems like there's a, there's a tonal disconnect here the same way that like you know, you watch a TV show like The Wire and you watch a TV show like Breaking Bad and they're very, 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 very fucking different. They're both dealing with crime, with drugs, with killing rivals and shit like that. But one of them is grounded in reality and all the disappointments and all of the, you know, all of the realism that comes with that. And it's great for that. And then the other one is great for the opposite. Do you know what I mean? 
the di- for a Serbian film, the thing that falls apart for it is is you know everything, everything it it shoves in there as in terms of disgusting shit. Oh, Randy, so are poor you... choice of words. Yeah, 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 yeah. probably. Are you are you Catch suggesting you fuckers at a bad time? Are you suggesting that a Serbian film is the Breaking Bad of film? It's the is Breaking that, Bad of that, film, guys. Is no. that, that what you're saying? They're that, the same that, thing. They're they're the same exact a, thing. A Serbian film is the a Serbian film of a Serbian films. It is. <laughs> it's, um, and everything that that entails. It's the best Serbian film I've ever seen. It's the only one. It's the best a Serbian film I've ever a Serbian seen. Do we have anything else worth mentioning on Old Boy before we rate it? Uh, I really like this scene where he breaks down. Where he yeah, with the tongue and everything. Yeah. That shit makes and, me so fucking sad. It does, yeah. It's it's a it's man. It's like watching a train wreck, or say you yeah. just mm-hmm. oh man, it's terrible. And also, we mentioned the hammer scene is badass, but there's a couple. I liked his his fight with Mister Han. That shit was pretty cool. He gets his ass it was. whooped. He <laughs> does. He only barely. He could. He almost would have won without uh, without Eugene's help. But then Eugene blasts Han in the head. Yeah, and saves him in the last second, just so, so. that he can continue with his vengeance quest. And we mentioned um, this with Thirst too, where they'll, you know, they blend genres a lot in mm-hmm. Korea. Where with Thirst, it was like this romantic comedy. There's a lot of gore and like crazy stuff going on. This is kind of similar in that, like, it's kind of an action movie, more, I guess, like the foundation. Um, but it's got this weird mystery. And then uh, at one point, you think is a love story. And then they twist it on its own fucking head. And then it becomes Dude. a terrible distortion of, I don't know, I like the kind of blends because it's not just like Fast and the Furious, it's action. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, and, and there's, there's, va- there's merit to movies like that, but they're just sure, very, yeah. very different kinds of merit. And, and also, I wanted to bring this up because I had mentioned it earlier or, or referenced it. The end of this movie, which, is you know after all that happens and Odysseus has nothing left in his life except for the potential for a forgetful uh relationship with Mido his daughter he goes for it with his uh hip the hypnotist that he finds and at the end of this after he's hypnotized or whatever he's found in the snow by Mido and she's like oh are you okay or whatever and she's like who is out here with you and there's two sets of tracks and two two chairs sitting there which leads you to think that it's possible that they'll just follow those breadcrumbs the same way they followed the fucking blue dragon breadcrumbs and everything else and find out again that he's in love with his daughter and been like doing horrible things with his daughter. So, I mean, and here's another thing is something I found out by watching some true crime or listening to some true crime stuff. There's at least a few cases where, um, and this, this is from one in particular, and I don't remember the specifics of the case, but a woman was reconnected with her like estranged father who she had never met who was like just a rat bastard and ended up being a serial killer um and the two of them fell in love and in the course of this fucking discussion of this thing i was like what are they talking about apparently there's like a scientific thing where like one in like ten thousand cases where an estranged son or daughter meets up with her estranged uh, a biological dad or biological mother there's some sort of weird juju that happens where they're similar enough and they're disconnected enough to where they are sexually attracted and people live out their whole lives this way as a relationship. I'm just letting you guys know that's a thing that happens. And I don't know the specifics and I'm probably misrepresenting one or two things. Oh, about it's it. some, it's somewhat based in reality then, huh? Yeah. But I don't know if this movie, I don't know if they knew this when they wrote the fucking story to this, <laughs> but I'm just saying like, there is an element of disgusting reality in that. And you know, no kink shaming situation that we are. I'm just like, <laughs> we're two adults. As long as you're not a serial murderer and not producing like four headed babies, I guess. Uh, I don't know. I, don't know. I prefer my babies with four heads. Randy. I think I'm gonna, sh- I'm gonna shame I that kink as well. Separate heads. I know. <laughs> don't have sex with your family. Members. I don't know. Yeah, don't that's, know uh, I'm shaming it. I'm shaming all right. It. Well, I mean. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna die on this hill. So Bob, are you, you gonna go shame right this kink? You're a big it's, advocate for not kink shaming. Is that even a kink? I, I agree that you should not do that. <laughs> 
it's yes. fucked up. I agree that it's pretty repulsive to me. <laughs> but I don't even know that that's a kink people have. I guess it happens. The thing is, I'm cable. also repulsed by the idea of ass to mouth. So I'm not doing that. But people love that <laughs> shit. It's the hottest people shit. People love that so, shit. So I mean, I just don't know. I don't know where that line is drawn anymore. <laughs> and I just really don't want to tell people what to do. All I can say is that it repulses the fuck out of me. And I really don't think that the world needs any any children that can't you know sit up or whatever anymore if you like, never <laughs> listen to this cash you know for damn sure uh, randy is not an ass man true <laughs> poop comes out of there <laughs> i love poop. that shit every time it comes up that shit cracks me up i'm uh, just not into it <laughs> let's let's go ahead and rate this thing out of five juice would you please do us the honors and kick us off how you feel about old boy yeah, so this this movie came from my poll pick, um, something we're doing this year where we get to pick all three movies. And I picked all three movies with a similar kind of theme of them being like not really horror, but like these dark kind of psychological thrillers in a way. Um, and I think this would be the case for all three of them. It's why I picked them because I love all three of them. Um, but I'm going to give this one a five. But I even like thought about it this week. I like I kind of knew that when I picked all three movies. That's you know again why I picked them. But I really leading up to this, knowing that it was um, this film, I tried to put some research into it. I watched the Vengeance trilogy. I um, like try to compare it to other films. I did want to watch the 2013 um, American remake with uh, Josh Brolin. I just didn't get a chance to do it. Um, I like, I wanted to, cause I wanted to at least be able to wrap it in some way. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm curious too. Um, but I, I distinctly remember watching this film for the first time. And again, it just stuck in my brain. It is something that has lived there ever since. It like, kind of blew me away and created this kind of weird foundation for what to expect from Korean films. Um, I've also now watched almost all of this director's work um, and I really like him as a director. And this still, we covered Thirst last year. I gave it a four and then 0.5 for the Yabos, but I like this movie more and I love Thirst. Um, this movie's just, I that idea of it being so dark and twisted and so distinctly like unique in a way and yet so touted in Korea I, there's something about that that I love I, it's so weirdly twisted that just so <laughs> many people would like tout this movie and how dark it is but I agree with them though because I love the film so I, it's almost like finding these like comrades like yeah we all think this movie's baller even though it's so fucked up like yeah cool I mean, that's if that America has its share of those, I mean, shit, we're doing a sure. horror movie podcast. I mean, The yeah. Shining, I mean, for its time, I think, certainly, uh, probably had a similar sort of effect on people that I think this movie did. The Exorcist, for God's sake, yeah, that still has the yeah. reputation for what it is. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I think that, you know, any, any, I think it's rad that, you know, Korea, like, because of this film, was able to break into the international market on the back of, like, one really strong film because, um, you know, America is like the like ground zero for the, for obviously Hollywood and for yeah. like, like uh, international film production and things like that. So we had a pretty easy go, but we could make a bunch of fuck ups and still have one or two Wizards of Oz to get us by <laughs> and, you know, shit like that. But Korea didn't necessarily have that on an international scale, at least not to my knowledge. And this movie really like once you get like they started capturing people like us like dudes in college in america yeah and that's like you're like that's and a pretty big step to becoming like sure a, like some like of widely work. respected mm -hmm. uh source of film anyway i'm sorry i'm tangenting here but yeah, i think so, that is really fucking interesting <laughs> i do i don't know it's not, it kind of like tickles me I, I like that it's so dark and fucked up and so many people like i don't know still recommend it and love it so again this is a five i i like the style there are problems i like think with the with like the logic of the mystery it's like again like i said at the beginning it's not a mystery you could ever solve from the beginning like oh i know 
But, and so I think knowing now that it's based off like a comic book and so it has like a source material, it never bothered me anyways, because it had a little bit of that feel, but it like, especially doesn't bother me now. And I like the more of the like philosophical ideas behind it. The action's kick ass. That fucking hammer scene is so dope. I love that shit so much, but yeah, five stars for me. Cool. Five stars from Soju. Who I'm wants gonna, to go next, Bob? I'm going to slide yeah, in here so right. Randy can't change I'll his, his rating on me. Out of five, Bob, what you going to give? Oh, boy. Um, I remember the first time watching this movie being pretty blown away. Um, over like the course of subsequent viewings, I feel like it doesn't stick with me quite as hard as it did originally. Um, maybe just because I've seen like more Korean movies since then or just more movies in general. Uh, but the... Uh, the shock value has, has sort of like worn off a little bit, I guess. Like the movie is real twisted, um, but like there are no likable characters in it at all, which I think if Odesu was like somewhat of a redeemable character, I think it would sort of improve upon the movie a little bit for me. Um, there are some, some holes in the plot that, that feel like out of place in this movie or like you know, plot devices that feel out of place in this movie that sort of take me out of it a little bit um some of the choices just seem kind of strange the craft of the movie is phenomenal it looks great um the acting is fantastic the the fight choreography is definitely one of the the standouts if not the standout of this movie um that one action sequence in the hallway is is i mean is people rave about it everybody knows about that scene you know um overall though i think i'm gonna land at a 3.5 for old boy um little bit lower than I anticipated giving it but I don't know this is probably the third time I watched it and it just doesn't feel quite as uh, uh, like game changing to me now I guess and maybe that's you know just with you know an extra you know 13 years of movie watching or 17 years 17 years of movie watching you've watched some fucked up shit since then Bob. yeah for sure you've seen a lot of arrow films since you're numb (laughs) you're numb just like the Lincoln Park song, it's gonna be. Come so there you go. Get on that's that, Bob. Right now, get on that, Randy. Uh, yeah, three point five from your boy Bob. All right, Randy, how do you feel about Old Boy? Um, so I love this movie. I mean, it's been it, like you guys when we first watched it, or first time I watched it, whenever that was. It was pretty game changing for me in terms of how I was thinking about international film. I hadn't seen a lot of international film that really rose to the challenge of um at least international from beyond like the western world shall we say um that really rose to the challenge of things like um like i don't know big budget fucking major movies here just purely out of like budgetary constraints and just a different kind of industry setting i imagine so this kind of like was like one of the movies that made me be like okay so what's going on out there these guys have some great storytelling chops they have you know they're getting the the same diet of movies that we get they're just not getting it from the source (laughs) like we do Um, as being Americans where most fucking major production internationally known films come from. So I don't know. In that way, it's really impactful for me and just culturally in general. Uh, Cinematically, it's so fun to watch. I couldn't disagree more with Rob about its impact, you know, on repeat viewings. I think I've probably seen this like five times now, and I've never not been just heartbroken sad for Desu and Nido at the end because like... It, it, uh, it not the the way that the thing that he does to them the thing that uh, Eugene does to them is so I don't want to say perverse it like gets perverse but it's more than that it's 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 so fucking goddamn evil to take what like a reconnection of a a long separated father and son a wrong, wrongly separated father and daughter excuse me and reconnecting them in such a way as to trick them trick them into crossing lines that no culture accepts crossing. You know what I mean? So it's just very, very heartbreaking to me that they they were tricked in such a way, especially Mido, who's literally just a child and has no say in any of the sins that uh, Desu is supposed to die for. So I don't know. It's the fact that a movie can still impact me that well after repeat viewings is the biggest indicator I have that this is a movie for me. This is a movie that I think deserves high praise deserves a high score so i was oscillating between a four and a 4.5 i'm gonna go with the 4.5 the shortcomings we talked about are um pretty much all that i have in terms of shortcomings 
the way some of these things hang together is a little weird. It's a little strange to have the magical realism sitting right next to the visceral realism, but there is a purpose to it, which we discovered in our conversation here today. So like that helped put that into perspective for me. Um, but it's still sort of like on viewing every time I watch it, I'm sort of like, okay, so there's a guy with a dog up here. What is this guy with a dog doing up here? Who sent this guy up here? And I don't know, shit like that, like just little things that I, that's just the way my mind works. I'm very much like, I'll pick things apart. You guys know this at this point. So, um, I love the music choice. It's something that stuck out to me this time that I never really noticed before. Uh, it keeps me thinking about the philo- like what Justin was saying. There's a philosophy to this movie. I'm not sure that I have it fully down pat though. Still, which might be a shortcoming of the storytelling, or might be a strength of the storytelling, depending on how you want to look at it. So, for me, I think this movie has. Uh, I think there are things that could have probably been done to improve this movie, but it's so fucking enjoyable that I can't reasonably give it less than a four point five. I'm gonna go with that. All right, 4.5 from Randy. That's going to set our aggregate at a 4.3. Let's go ahead and jump over into our Rotten Tomato segment and see what the critics and users think about Old Boy. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is the Rotten Tomato segment in which I'm going to be looking at the critics and user score on RottenTomatoes.com. And I'm going to have these two gentlemen guess between the uh, uh, zero and 100 percent what percentage they think ha- of critics and users gave this a positive score. One day I'm going to write down the intro to this, <laughs> and it's not going to sound like somebody <laughs> slapping together a book report at the last second. You won't. You will um, never write it down. It's you know it's not going to happen. Um, <laughs> uh, all right, let's start with the critic score. I think that last week we started with Justin for the critics. So let's start with Rob for the critics today. There are 150 critic reviews for this film. Um, enough for a good uh, sample size yeah, for critics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A- enough to go off of for sure. So, Rob, what are you thinking the critics gave this movie? I feel like this is somewhat of a critical darling. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm going to go pretty high. I'll. I'll basically mirror our score. I'll, I'll go with an 85. 85 percentile. All right. Juice, how you feeling? Damn. That's, you know $1? That's what, I, well, that's what I was gunning for, honestly. I was kind of set on 85. I, I think it's going to be high as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and also it's got like the international status that tend to like go over well with the critics. But I, I, 86 seems too high. I, I like I don't think it's in the 90s because of its dark nature. I think it's gonna drop a scope. Like there's gonna be people who have a problem with the incest. It's those like, damn oh, Christians, I tell you. They'll oh, God, why don't they like <laughs> incest? Um so I I yeah. just I think I'm gonna one dollar down and just say an 84. I'm not gonna take the high end. You're gonna discount. All right. Well, uh 84 from Soju, 85 from Bob. And Soju's going to take it this time. He was dead on with the uh, with the discount dollar. It's an eighty-two percent. Oh, close, close. So you guys are you guys are right in the right zone. I actually would have definitely gone a dollar higher. So well done, Juice. The straight chilling crew is with the P, or well, now with the critics. Ooh, let's see. Yeah. The, the we're with the we're with the P. Yeah, but <laughs> boys. Yeah. Hey, ah, I like your hat. Oh, cut you off at the pass. Like, <laughs> I've been doing that. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. And it feels like ages. Um, let's go to our audience score. There are uh, 100,000 plus ratings from users. For this film. Soju, uh, you're going to get the first bite of the apple this time. What are you thinking? Actually, I think it's going to be lower. Okay. Um, I know it's got like the cult status and everything, but. I still think it's going to be lower, um, but not too low. I'll give it a 75. 75%. Bob, how do you feel about the user score? I feel like everybody I hear talk about this movie just loves it. They seem, everybody raves about this movie. Obviously, there, there's got to be some people out there that don't like it. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to one dollar up juice. You said 75. Ooh. I'm going to go 76. 76 year of our nation 76 um 
This time, Bobby's going to take it. It's actually well, well higher than either of you guessed. It's 94%. Damn. Wow. That is way higher than I thought. Oh, damn. So, hey, Bob. You know. Yep. Yeet mesquite, bish. Yeet mesquite, bish. <laughs> no, that's right. what you get now. No, that's, that's what you get now. <laughs> You get that. All right. Eat let's read ski, a negative. Sore ass loser. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> sore ass, anyway. Um, that sore critics ass. consensus. <laughs> Violent and definitely not for the squeamish. Park Chanwook's visceral old boy is a strange, powerful tale of revenge. That seems more like a synopsis than a critics consensus, but all yeah. right. Um, cool. And here's <laughs> one negative review. All right. Be amazed at my cruel virility. Feel the pain. Oh, yeah. What? <laughs> oh, yeah. Be bedazzled. <laughs> be, please be I bedazzled. Wish we please. <laughs> review that says be prepared. It is very be bizarre bad. indeed. <laughs> I, I hope that, like, hey, if we're soliciting five star reviews right now, People, just tell us how bedazzling we are on iTunes, please. Yeah. We are, by the way. If you listen to the show and dig what we do, please do leave us a five-star rating and review over on iTunes. It's a great way to support the show, and it only takes a minute or two of your time. Yeah, Bob will literally love you for it. True. Yeah, and that almost as much as he hates the negative reviews. <laughs> almost. <laughs> almost, but there's very few hates that could match that. We don't need to get into Rob that. is training his mind and body to... Uh, <laughs> defeat somebody in a Machiavellian <laughs> scheme by imprisoning them for 15 years for Man. leaving a negative review that says fart on this podcast. <laughs> if, if, you, if you have a relative that you can fuck, watch out because I'm coming for you. <laughs> oh no, that's uh, whoo, we're getting specific. All right. Um, that's it for it the Rotten Maters though. That shit's tight. Rotten. Tight, tight, tight. Not Let's rotten. go ahead and uh, jump into that big steaming pile of trivia. It's totally time for trivia. All right, boys, we're going to start right off with a little game. So there was a scene where Shiboy Desu goes to a sushi bar. He eats a live octopus. That shit was real. And not only was it real, I want you to guess how many times he did that. So how many live octopi... <laughs> Live How many did he eat? How many? Um, yeah. So, um, Bob. Yeah. I'll let you go first. Bob, how many do you think he ate? Um, octopi. Octopi is my favorite pie because you get to eat eight of them. So I'm going to say eight times. Eight? Randy! How many um, do you think he ate? I'm going to use my boy nick cage is inspiration he nice. has two <laughs> for vampire's kiss and i'm gonna guess the same number for old desu here how many two two Which, two two okay two of them and bob what'd you say eight yeah all right it's probably Ooh. gonna be higher because that's a more interesting trivia if it's extra high but whatever randy's gonna take it hey all right <laughs> four live octopi were eaten for the scene with desu in the sushi bar a scene with a scene which provokes some controversy abroad. Mm -hmm. Eating live octopus in Korea is commonplace, although it is usually sliced first. When the film won the Grand Prix at the Pecans Film Festival, the, dire oh, wow. the director thanked all of the octopi along with the cast and crew. <laughs> that's well, that's funny. what it's all about. Was, did they yeah. have to... When, did they when have to when you were living in Korea, did you eat any live octopi? I did. It's called sanak tea, and I did have it one time. I did not bite the head off, but I have had the live octopus. You ate the tentacles? Oh. Mouthful of tentacle? Yeah, and now uh, we're going to get boycotted. The way those tentacles is it, like, <laughs> yeah. got out of his mouth is so distressing to me. Yeah, that was really dark. Really disturbing. Was it good? Did you like it? It was fine. You like you can dip it in like some sesame like sauce that they mix with like pepper or whatever yeah. sesame oil um and i mean it it's it's it doesn't have any particular effect it's wild because <laughs> the tentacles well, yeah. like grab you like even uh, getting it off of your chopstick it'll like grab your tongue like as you're eating like suction and shit and like as it, like it's on your chopstick and like i have a video of it it like won't let go sometimes you're like shit like 
get in my mouth. <laughs> Hi, you're a monster. And it move it moves like on the plate. It's like wriggles around. It's pretty wild. Well, that's, but yeah, that, people that's love that shit. damn horrific sound. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I, people I don't love it. That. Would you say it's wriggle toony? <laughs> wriggle toony. Wriggle toony. I'd there eat it again, but I would never crave it. I would never be that's right. good. But if like somebody like wanted to go, I would be fine, I guess. It's, it's, it's no fine. malort. I mean <laughs> <laughs> some things, True. some Rubicons you just don't cross twice. All right. All right. Uh, the line on the painting of Desu Cell reads, Laugh and the world laughs with you. Weep mm. and you weep alone. These are the first lines of Ella Wheeler Wilcox's famous poem, Solitude. Okay. Um, well, that makes sense. That's um, I, I really like that line because the way they use it is having Desu's like, like gnarled up, like shaking smile, like multiple yeah. times throughout the suit movie where yeah. he's clearly like doing it as a reaction to his pain. But at the end of the film, when he's, supposed to be in the most pain but he's post hypnosis it's like he's got a pain that he doesn't even understand is still there so he's hugging Mido post his hypnosis and putting on this face but it seems more genuine because he's actually kind of forgotten and is kind of able to be happy but there's also something underlying that's not I love that yeah. um all right uh finally let's see oh this is the actor Min Sheik is a Buddhist and he had to pray after eating the poor octopi because they're not oh, supposed man. to eat meat. <laughs> they got to eat it live. Yeah. Um, there's a ton of trivia, but we got uh, lots to do. So let's go ahead and head into the hunting segment. We talk the cooter of the week. Straight chilling. Cooter of the week. Juice, what is a cooter and why are we hunting them? Cooter is a character type and a straight chill and exclusive. Uh, cooter has to hit three of these five points to be considered a cooter. Five points are manipulation, smug arrogance, sexual deviance, Overall looking attire and overall patheticness. Boys, I think we're going to have some good Cooter <laughs> candidates this week. Agreed. Who would like to nominate someone to Cooter Court first? Uh, well, you got, you got old Evergreen Terrace. Eugene. Eugene. Ever yeah. He's, Ever he's, he's a Cooter as fuck. Well, um, give me a point, Bob. Yeah. What's give me okay. one of the points? He's uh, nude a lot. Hang on. He's, <laughs> manipulation out there. All right. Ass. So Bob is nominating manipulation. Bob, how does he manipulate? Well, I don't remember. How? No. How, Rob? <laughs> he manipulates Ode Su the entire film, as uh -huh. well as poor little Mido. So also, we we didn't really touch on this in the movie. I assume that he locks Ode Su up. Odesu up for 15 years because his daughter is three years old when he captures her. Yeah, to so grow up. Yeah, that is the point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he he raises that girl for 15 years and she doesn't know who the fuck he is or like why he's doing it. But so that's like insane. Yeah. Manipulation. Oh yeah. I would yeah. like to nominate uh look and attire. And there's one specific scene I would like to point to as evidence mm -hmm. here in Cooter Court. The tramp stamp. The tramp stamp. <laughs> I'm giving the licking a tire for the cross tramp stamp right above his naked bum ass. Um, I'd like to apologize on behalf of Soju for anyone listening who may or may not have a tramp stamp. Well, I just this one specifically, I think, led to the cooter looking a tire. Gotcha. I think that matches. <laughs> I Is mean, everybody the man okay spends with that? a lot of time. Yeah, that's fine. I, to me, like, <laughs> as far as attire, the fact that he's like, I know it's his office or whatever, but there are multiple people in there hanging out, doing shit, working yeah. for him while he's walking around nude. And to me, that's just, it's a little cootery behavior. I don't know if that's the right category for it. But it, also, it's also that man, that man has a ton of money, a ton, of mm -hmm. apparently. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. He should not be wearing a bucket hat. <laughs> bucket hat and tramp for a bucket stamps hat. that combo that's gonna get him dude you get you a bucket me. hat you get yourself some slick bright yellow goggles yeah. and a it was sweater like vest. a you in the 90s Vuitton baby bucket hat you think you so, in the late Bob? 90s early 2000s get some jinkos in there hell yeah yeah um, all right uh randy I think the you pathetic for that point 
no, I mean, I was going to continue with this. <laughs> oh, okay, go ahead. For Eugene, like, I mean, his whole existence pretty much is pretty pathetic, right? Like, you know, it's you, know, you knock up your sister, she kills herself, and you can't handle it. Therefore, you construct a reality and build an empire, a literal, like, fucking business empire based on the steam of your hatred for somebody <laughs> who has way less to do with your misery than you yourself that's fucking pathetic it's pretty pathetic you gotta inhale that steam um sexual deviance yeah. we don't really see a whole lot of that no no <laughs> just no. kidding he knocks up he his deviates that is sexually. not okay <laughs> yeah even quite... if it's consensual which actually it's like i don't know she's kind of like forty saying that it's not very clear and it's also yeah. kind of a twist of perception but I will say no matter even if it's consensual, you should not have sex and impregnate your underage sister. Don't I, do it. I agree. Sometimes consent <laughs> is not enough. Don't do it. I don't yeah, know, man. My my, my my role is usually if it's consensual consenting adults, which they aren't, that's kind of the key factor there for me. Yeah. 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 Consenting adults uh are gonna do what they're gonna do. And if you know they're not hurting anybody, then that's kind of my my that's my but if she gets pregnant, place. then there's a high risk that child could be right, deformed. which is so why that's hurting it's somebody. There, with, you're right, and I'm I, and I'm not talking about their case necessarily in particular. I'm just talking about the very concept. I don't okay. think that on on of its sur, on a surface level on its own. I mean, it's if we're talking kinks, like if people want to do, they're gonna do it. You know, so what I mean? real quick, Randy, can you say I support incest? Can you say that for me, real quick? No, but I can clip out a segment of you saying that. And use it as a bump. Do it. We got Rob's daddy kink. <laughs> I'll take that over the incest one any day. <laughs> well, anyway, yeah, I don't know. I, I, it's definitely, it's definitely sexually deviant, no matter how you slice it. Yeah, he also manipulates uh, two other people who are related to bang so he, that, i think that falls under sexual deviance as well I yeah that's true like yeah. everything he oh, does yeah, is, yeah. is 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 driven by a, a perverse sexual deviance yeah, by, yeah it's not just manipulating somebody to like do something bad it's yeah. like sexually driven yeah that's pretty fucked up yeah. Yeah. and um uh arrogance is he is this man arrogant? oh yeah i think he hits all the points and i think have, he's yeah have, have you seen the bucket hat <laughs> you son of a bitch i think i Eric. think so i think so yeah. i think even the way he like calls and teases go and yeah yeah, yeah. it's, it's pretty it's arrogant. audacious that he yeah it's audacious that not only does he do those things but he does them successfully like that's well, the unbelievable thing you know and he throws <laughs> his money around he's like oh you thought oh. this guy was with you i bought his whole building you bitch oh yeah <laughs> he says bitch too. he does he does he also it. kills a dude in a public space with <laughs> no worries whatsoever he kills mm. uh Desu's, like old uh oh yeah and the old the pc internet bar yeah with a that's right. broken fucking cd rom that's a that's a <laughs> 90s way to go i can think of Fuck your free AOL. That's what he said. <laughs> there you go. So I think he hits all the points personally. And I think for particularly it's all tied into the manipulation stem. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think he's a cooter as fuck. I don't imagine yeah. we're going to find a cooter that's more cooter than this man in this movie. Uh, Evergreen so. Terrace I think there's an, yeah. Yeah. takes the cake. Ever. There's arguments for others, but there's nobody who's going to outshine this bitch. No, he, can't, he can't outshine. Nope. <laughs> For sure. Book we got him. him. We got him. We got book him, boys. Good hunt, fellas. Uh, it's time to let our hair down. We're getting into what we've been watching Shit. this week. Hey, gang. What, what you been, been watching? watching? Randy, what you been what? watching? Well, not a whole ton. Not a whole ton here. Um, I watch, I've been Half watching. Time. Yeah, maybe, maybe a quarter ton. Uh, I've been watching WandaVision. Last week, I was a little bit down on it. Uh, there was an episode that I was like, I'm not sure where this is going, and it may not go somewhere that's interesting to me, but they brought it back for me. I'm I'm very engaged with it. I think there's one, maybe two more episodes, and I'm very interested to see how it ends. I'm especially excited to hear, and I don't, this is totally hearsay. I could be totally wrong on this, but I, as I understand it, that this is a one-off, like almost mini-series level thing where there's not going to be a continuation, which I think is the smartest thing they can do because this is definitely just a really long Marvel movie. 
Um, that's, that's just, it's just told episodically because it kind of lends itself to that. Um, I'm enjoying it. Uh, I watched the mountain goats, Jordan Lake sessions. They did a, a review on that. I've been watching their live performances in a, in a big empty studio that they did. Um, it's very, very good. They're one of my favorite bands. Uh, like I said, it's a slim week. So that's, that, that got to come up. Um, I watched uh, a show called on YouTube called VCR Party by the Found Footage Festival, which is just a bunch of people that involved with that organization, I guess, getting together and showing off their new finds um, of really bizarre or odd things that they found on VHS tapes or in, you know, anachronistic old, old, you know, stacks of DVDs or whatever else, which is where I found my favorite thing that I watched this week, which is actually a McGruff the Crime Dog song that was produced in the 80s that made me laugh so fucking hard and is actually a straight up as the children say bop it is a fun fucking song wow um yeah cracking cocaine that's the good shit mcgruff the crime dog sings with kids look that shit up it is a legitimately good song and it's very very funny to hear a man do a dog's voice and sing about cocaine oh wow it's very 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 good. i can't wait to hear that Oh, it's you on didn't listen Slack, on the Slack, Bob. It's oh, Slack, I missed man. it. Oh, you got to check that shit out, man. It is so good. We'll share it in the show notes or something. And then, last but not least, I saw that Little Nightmares Two had come out, so I went to see if Switch had it, and they did. And they also had Little Nightmares One, which I didn't realize, and it was on sale for seven dollars. So I have just just barely started Little Nightmares, the first one, and I'm enjoying it. So that's Good. that's the short version if you get stuck on a puzzle randy i believe we have a full walkthrough available on the youtube oh damn yeah don't go fishing for views man come on just saying if you get stuck <laughs> got you so you got you juice what you been watching uh let's see i did watch those other two movies um sympathy for mr vengeance and lady vengeance um that make up the trilogy and i like them in different ways both of them the first half I was like, do I like this? I don't think so. But then by the end of the movies, both of them, I kind of felt the same way. I was like, oh yeah, that was pretty good. And I've been thinking about them since. They're no old oh boy, that's for damn sure. But they're, um, they've are they got their own flavors and they're um, interesting in their own ways. But they do take a little patience to kind of get through. Um, real fucked up shit um, though. Really fucked up shit. Um, yeah, it's dark stuff. I didn't realize yeah it's really dark um i also just got on this random kick uh to play some zelda so i started with the og and um that i i beat it like several times and i enjoy playing through it but it's one of those ones that it it almost is like going through the steps a little bit it doesn't have the soul to me that like a link to the past has where i still find it very beautiful the music very moving in a lot of ways it's just like almost like a this is neat kind of thing because for its time that shit's pretty groundbreaking like oh my god like all these it's a good thing now yeah you can go to this dungeon over here and stuff and i get a kick out of playing through it It doesn't take me too long because i've played it so many times now but um I played through that and then I had never played the Minish Cat before. So I have oh. my little retro pie thing and I have it on there. So I started to play it. Um, it's It was done by Capcom, which is weird. Yeah. Um, but they did a I, few for handhelds. Yeah. So I started to play through that one. I haven't got too far into it. It's okay. It's it's um it's got some of the music from Ocarina of Time in it, but done in like a more 8-bit style um so that's kind of it's weird it's weird to hear it in that style that was gba right not that's not the one from that's not one of the ds ones right i i honestly one screen correct i think so yeah okay all right i think so but i'm i'm not 100 percent sure so i'll tell you man complete tangent if you ever get a chance to play that uh link's awakening remake on switch yeah i want it's worth it it looks beautiful um other than that though I, that's a bit, that's been about it bob yo what kind of baby blues you've been watching this week no baby blues <gasps> actually what whoa um, just laser disc uh no no i've been watching shit on the big screen actually um shout out still sunray cinema uh they're still keeping the drive in strong here in saxonville florida um they they 
did a showing of Princess Bride at the drive-in this past weekend. We went and checked that out. It was a lot of fun. It was conceivably fantastic. Uh, if you haven't seen that movie, it's, it's a classic. Definitely watch it. Um, also, uh, speaking of Sunray, they're doing this really cool thing. Well, the, uh, you know, the, they will let you rent out an entire movie theater um, and play any movie of your choice um, for a small fee. And you can just invite a group of your friends and, you know, they kind of keep it social distance. So that there is a cap of how many people to let in the theater. Um, uh, but uh, it was my girlfriend's birthday over the weekend. We rented the theater out. We watched that thing you do. It was a lot of fun. Um, again, if you that, haven't seen yeah, that thing you choice. do, yeah, it's a fucking classic. Like watch that thing you do. Tom Hanks, uh, his directorial debut. Uh, he, he's also uh, uh, plays a, a pretty major role in the movie, uh, but he wrote and directed it. It's about uh, this upcoming band in the the late fifties, early sixties, right around there, um, 60s, and sixties. Yeah, yeah it, they they get like you know a number one hit record, and it's about them, uh, you know, uh, going from zeros to heroes, basically. Uh, great movie, check it out. Don't watch um, the director's cut, is my opinion. That's I agree. I agree with that. Yeah, the th the theatrical cut it's is better. A little meandering. Yeah, um, but other than that, and old boy, that's really all I've been watching this week. Um, that's a hell of a combo. That's all, yeah, right. <laughs> that Princess Bride and with the old boy. Old boy. <laughs> um, yeah, that's all I got. We got one more segment to get to here this week. It is, of course, our hotline scream. <laughs> if you are listening and would like to call in and leave a voicemail, you can hit us up at 904-638-3231. Uh, we again have been getting a shitload of voicemails over the past couple of weeks. Uh, we're gonna get we're gonna play um, four tonight, so there's a few that aren't aren't gonna be aired, but do not fret. We'll be getting to them next week. Um, first up, I forget what our prompt even was last week, or even if we had one. <laughs> Who knows? They'll remind us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what y'all say. Uh, first yeah. up, we're, uh, we're going to hear from, I think, G-Baby. Let's, see, let's, see, let's listen to G-Baby. Yo, what's up, crew? G-Baby. Uh, calling in. I missed the, the Valentine's Day cutoff. It's going to Knock that one out a little bit early. Um, in terms of what we do for Valentine's Day, nothing too crazy. Um, we are a couple of weirdos. So, like, one year I dressed up like a Cupid. I wrapped a white towel around myself like a diaper, like sumo style, and put hearts on my nipples and fashioned a bow and arrow out of twigs and some twine and took pictures of myself and made a big collage on a board. Um, so that was fun. Um, my wife got a kick out of that. She actually went up me this year for Valentine's Day. She went on this, there's a site called Songfinch <clears throat> where you can go and uh, you give, they have like a stable of professional, you know, songwriters and performers. You pay a bunch of money and you give them background on like your relationship or whatever you want them to do to craft a song. Uh, with and uh, then they mix it, record it, whatever, and kick it back to you in an MP3. Uh, so my wife did that, and she picked this dude. He's an Irish like folk singer, uh, younger dude named Tiz McNamara. He's actually on Spotify. Um, I just thought I'd share this because I thought I'm, I'm super proud of my wife, and it's such a, a dope gift, and it's funny too. Um, so she wrote this. Or this dude wrote the song and uh, put it together, and she gave it to me for Valentine's Day this year. I thought it was just super rad. Uh, she made it funny. That's who we are. So I'm going to play a little clip that I thought you guys would enjoy. I hope you know you're my best friend, and I will love you till the end. What Sharknado gave me bonus. <laughs> Uh, some background on that uh, that's like an inside thing with me and my wife one day I was scrolling through Netflix and I was like oh Sharknado's on and she just popped up and was like Sharknado gave me a boner <laughs> so it's like an inside <laughs> funny thing between us and she incorporated it into this loving like folksy <laughs> Valentine's Day song which I thought was pretty badass 
and I wanted to share it. So, anywho, uh, later, crew. Happy. Hope you all had a happy Valentine's Day, and keep chilling, children. I love that G Baby's living up to his name with that diaper. G Baby. Yeah. <laughs> That way, I thought I was going to go a more kinky route with the old diaper and everything. Trust well, he did talk about a boner NATO. So. Whoa. Dude, that shit is hilarious. And also hilarious is the, tech, is the speech to text, which reads, I was scrolling through Netflix and I was like, oh, sure, NATO's on NATO, <laughs> the National North American Trade Organization. My favorite and show. And she just popped up and was like, Sharknado gave birth. <laughs> Facts. I love it's that Randy gets funny. such a kick out of that. I fucking <laughs> love it, dude. <laughs> this shit's great. Thank uh, you, Jim. We appreciate thanks. that. Thanks, she baby. Yeah. That's super. Sounds sweet. like a pretty damn cool song. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. Like idea too. Yeah. 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 Thanks for sharing. Also, thanks for sharing the pictures of you in that diaper in the Slack channel. Way yeah, back it's my, when. It's my phone background now. <laughs> yeah, we've all saved it. Really appreciate that. Mm-hmm. Uh, next up, I believe we're going to hear from uh, Jackie. Let's hear what she has to say. What up, boys? It's Jackie B. Calling from Chicago. Um, I've called in too many times in the last few shows, but that's all right because I have nothing better to do. So I heard you talking on the last episode about blue-collar jobs, which I wouldn't you know, I'm a teacher, so I wouldn't necessarily consider that a blue-collar job. When I think of blue-collar jobs, I think of manual labor, which I'm not doing that, but I'm doing a lot of emotional labor, and I just had a funny story to share about these um, little monsters that I have to deal with every day. Um, <laughs> man, one thing about kids is they will say whatever the fuck comes to their mind so I had a student the other day that I came into work and I was justifiably exhausted because of teaching in a pandemic Um, and I did not look my best and one of my students looked at me and said "Uh, well someone's not dressed for the occasion so (laughs) I just thought that was funny and kids will say whatever the fuck they want and regardless of your self-esteem so that is my little um pandemic working story that's all love you guys uh keep chilling bye that was great (laughs) fuck that little kid (laughs) where'd you hide the body jackie yeah where'd you hide the body Little that's some shit that kids would only know to say because they heard their parents say it so the, that little kids oh, parents yeah. are assholes is what that's i'm trying true. to say that's true. <laughs> or Tell the media the media the media's <laughs> assholes is what i'm trying to say <laughs> yes yeah Thanks. i don't know like i don't know the delineation of blue collar jobs really i i do also think of manual labor but i've also heard like web web coding is considered a blue collar job no i think it's just like attainable skill-based jobs maybe what's in there what's it's like white collar and blue collar right yeah yeah white collar is like like middle management and up sort of deal okay that's my understanding i don't know i could i'm totally probably talking Uh, yeah i would like yeah i would lump like teachers in with like blue collar-esque you gotta deal with a lot of shit that's a lot of work it's not just emotional like i've seen teachers chasing kids around man that that is not a job that's easy to do in the best of times yeah so, and these are not those for yeah. sure <laughs> no they are not thanks for dealing with a lot of horseshit jackie uh yeah. try and teach those little fucking kids some manners please because their parents aren't that's for sure damn and the sure. media yeah, it's is all not. on you the it's damn all on you jackie media. it's all your only hope the teachers a straight you... chilling horror podcast <laughs> that's right talking uh, about you're keeping the faith talking about butthole nurses and everything <laughs> uh butthole nursing thanks for uh thanks for calling in uh jackie it's always good to hear from you we got we got two more next up miles that's what miles has to say hi what's going on guys it's uh miles here i was uh calling because i saw the youtube uh trailer reaction for mortal Kombat on the uh on the youtube channel um good job with that by the way i uh enjoyed it 
Um, definitely keep doing more of those trailer reactions. Um, but it reminded me of when I went to go see um, Mortal Kombat Annihilation in theaters. <laughs> Uh, so that came out in 1997, so I would have been seven years old. Um, so my mom took me to me and my brother to see that movie. And uh, the thing about the first Mortal Kombat movie is it's it's not exactly high art, but it's it's a real movie. It's competently made. Um, you know, the acting is good for what it is. Um, you know, not not a good movie. You could even say it was a bad movie, but it's it's a movie. It's a real movie. Uh, the second one, Mortal Kombat Annihilation, is one of the worst films ever made. It is a it is a pile of shit. It is awful in in every way imaginable. Um, but I didn't know that when I was seven. Um, I didn't really have you know refined taste um, in my elementary school years. Um, but yeah, so my mom took us to see that, um, and I was super into this movie, guys. I was like really into this movie. It was it was like the the coolest movie I'd ever seen, which by then I'd seen like three movies. So, um, you know, take that with a grain of salt. But um, about an hour into this movie, I have to pee. And I got to pee really bad. And as the movie goes on, um, you know, I have not gone to the bathroom. And it gets to the point, uh, it's near the final battle um, with Shao Kahn and uh, Liu Kang. Um, I think I got those names right. Um, but I am about to piss my pants. So seven-year-old me um, had a choice to make. I could either go to the bathroom and miss this um, awesome fight scene or piss my pants. And, you know, I went with the latter. I decided to um, piss my pants and just deal with the consequences later. And my mom was not happy, but I did see the rest of that shitty, shitty movie. Um, so I guess um, I, I'm asking you guys, uh, has there ever been a movie that you were so into that you would rather soil yourself? Um, yeah. So um, I'm thankful that Mortal Kombat, the new one is coming to HBO Max, because if I have to pee, I can just pause the movie. Um, because of technology now, which is great. But, uh, yeah, um, keep up the good work, guys. Um, yeah, definitely hope you see more of those uh, YouTube. I I think Miles got cut off there at the end, but I would yeah. like to say, if peeing your pants is cool, consider Miles' last name Davis. <laughs> wow. Yes, oh, Bob. Bob. Yes, Bob. Yes. Also... Yeah. No, I don't think I'd ever just pee my pants to see the end Dude, of the Dude, yeah. This that's a great story by the way, and I totally agree on the on Mortal Kombat series. I <laughs> Mortal Kombat Annihilation has a world famous bad line um when I think it's Sindel is reintroduced and her da- Jade's like, "Mother, you're alive." And she goes, "Too bad you will die." <laughs> exactly <laughs> like that. Exactly, I, fucking like that. It's. Great. I never pissed my pants in a movie, but I remember being shitting a your pants. Kid, mm-hmm. no, I puked like I crazy God. one time. God, damn. I, <laughs> I puked fucking everywhere one time, and <laughs> luckily we were in one of those back rows that's kind of off to the side. Um, you remember and the movie? So I literally like leaned over to the side and puked. <laughs> And we like left for a minute and like like went and kind of cleaned up and then we just went to the other side. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> you are literally chunk from the Goonies. That's some sh- that's that some real shit. shit. Do you that remember the movie happened. you were in? I think it was was a uh, Road to El Dorado. I was pretty like young. Oh. It was that animated. Yeah. I mean, I would hope so. It yeah, was, it wasn't Parasite. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I I did puke everywhere one time. So that shit. I don't have not. a story where I did that, and I doubt I would do that in a theater. I mean, certainly not now. But when I was a child, I did piss myself while sitting on my father's lap in oh. the Back to the Future ride. Oh. So he does not like that ride. No, Damn. that's. Uh, I have vivid memory. I was like three, so I mean, but I, oh, that's okay. one of my earliest memories is getting out of that thing wet and having no fucking regrets. I, I never, I don't have any memories of like peeing on myself, but I remember being 
in kindergarten, like sitting at a table with my classmates, there's like five or six kids at a table. I remember like drinking a lot of like fruit punch at lunch and feeling real sick and then just puking on the table. And I puked so much that it like overflowed on all the kids' laps. <laughs> it was insane. Um, then I changed schools. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, they, they couldn't get rid of my ass. I'm going anywhere. No, <laughs> fucking Big Red over here is going to be <laughs> barfing up blood on all the children. Oh, yeah, it's all red. Fuck. Yeah, it was, it was pretty gnarly. That's uh, nasty. Thanks, uh, Miles. We appreciate yeah. that. Thanks for sharing your PP pants story. Yeah, we uh, love honesty around these parts. We got one more voicemail. It is from Cole. Let's hear what he has to say. Hey guys, it's Cole calling. Uh, I called last week, a pointless message, and uh, it didn't get played because there are so many of us this week. So here's another message, probably won't get played, but I just I just had to call in and say zibbity zabbity for Randy Gandy G Landy. Thanks guys, keep chilling. Bye. My dick grew three times this day. <laughs> That was Damn. fabulous, Cole. Thank you for doing that. Uh, thank you for new. for canonizing my new and nonsensical catchphrase <laughs> that I came up with in less than a second. Yeah, Randy's got one. I got <laughs> hell ye. Bob, what do you have? I have. Uh, Rob's got red puke. Mm-hmm. I've got plenty okay. of things. Okay, Bob. <laughs> okay. Okay. My, <laughs> hell skeet clearly isn't taking off. That's fine. <laughs> That's fine. Baby blues are taking off always. Yeah, daddy does need a new blue. So there you go. We'll, we'll You've see. always got the blues, Bob. There's always, there's, there's always money in the blues. Yeah. <laughs> that's there's good, always that's lots good. of dollars in the blues. Mm-hmm. Whole uh, dollars. Thanks for calling, Cole. Uh, yeah, as we mentioned, we just get a shitload of voicemails. So we're, we're kind of working through some uh, ba- bit of a backlog here. Um, again, if you're listening and want to call and leave a voicemail, hit us up at 904-638-3231. Um, tell us about banging your family members or whatever. If you need what? some, if you need Please some kink counseling, do that. Kink counseling, yeah. Kink counseling from Soju. Call, us. Call in and workshop some workshop some uh, uh, mottos for Rob. Some, some yeah. catchphrases. <laughs> I got one, but I don't know if he's gonna like it. I have a daddy kink. <laughs> That one's going to stick around, I think. That's well, real I think strong. Randy will fucking see to it, that's for sure. <laughs> I mean, I have the power. Call in and tell us about all the live animals you've devoured. Let's, let us hear about all that. That's true. <laughs> What's the craziest thing you've eaten? <laughs> is it butt? Maybe. <laughs> According to it Randy, it is. <laughs> it could be butt. <laughs> Look, it, it is live. Uh, hopefully, hopefully it's live. God in heaven. My oh, God. Uh. <laughs> this is... We're getting darker than old boy here. I'm not into it. Uh. All right. That's enough of that. Um, thanks for calling in, everybody. Uh, that's going to do it for us this week at Straight Chilling. We're going to be back next week with a brand new show, as always. We're going to be talking about our next Patreon pick. This one was chosen by the old PP pants himself, Miles. Uh, <laughs> the movie is The Howling 2. Uh, slam your eyeballs into that. And get ready for next week's show. Until then... You can rate, review, and subscribe to us on iTunes. Uh, please hit us up on the Instagrams at Straight Chilling Podcast. We're on Twitter at str8 underscore chilling. You can send us an email through our website, straightchillingpodcast.com. If you want to join in on the daily Slack channel conversations and see whatever crazy nonsense Randy's posting up in there on the daily, uh, just let us know on one of those social media outlets, and I'll send you a link to join in on the fun. And until next week, as always, all you mother truckers, please keep chilling. I have a daddy kink.